one with, with billions of dollars to invest in infrastructure worldwide and R&D that is unparalleled even in the universities around the world or where it isn't in universities often funded by the industry. So my wish is to see the oil and gas industry rise to the occasion and we see the international oil and gas majors doing this in some of their messaging and name changes and uh, investment portfolios. Uh, but I'll give an example close to home because uh, I've seen how effective it's been. Except this isn't an oil and gas uh, example, so it, I think it provides one for us to emulate. Excel Energy, which operates in eight states, headquartered in Minnesota, but when there was a new administration here last fall in, in Colorado, they hadn't even been sworn in. A Democratic administration with climate as their top second, about their second priority. Excel Energy announced their uh, decarbonization uh, by 24, net carbon zero, they call it zero carbon. Um, the, they pr announced that aspiration for all eight of their states without a pathway. And again, I rolled my eyes and went, without a pathway, what is it with all these empty promises? Completely transformed the dialogue around climate in the state of Colorado has been fully embraced by the Polis administration, a Democratic administration here in Colorado, and I think it actually has made room for, the, for Colorado's oil and gas industry to join the decarbonization conversation. And most importantly, it's created 10, 20, 30 years for pragmatic solutions, which we don't have when we're having a beyond carbon conversation. Thanks, Tisha. Okay, great. If you could announce who you are, uh, just because we all want to know. It should be on. Let's try it. Yes. No. Nope. I don't know if it is. Try, try the other button. I thought it was on. Maybe I'll just... Just go uh, for it. <laughs> just go uh, for so it. So I'm Aaron Adamble. I work at the Embassy of Canada in Washington, D.C. Uh, thanks for, to all three of you for your comments. So my question also for Tisha. Uh, in terms of infrastructure challenges, uh, I don't know if we're yet at the point where litigation has to actually be factored into uh, uh, you know, oil and gas infrastructure companies' project timelines, but it's sort of starting to to feel that way, uh, but I know in, in certain cases, and I think there are three pipeline cases now where there is potential for them to get to the Supreme Court level, and I'm just wondering if, if that's if that's something that, that and, you know, remains to be seen whether the Supreme Court will take these up, but is that something that we're going to need to actually bring some finality to at least some aspects of this debate? And I agree with you on a paradigm shift that, that's needed, and I don't know that that would bring something there, but it may at least bring sort of some finality and moving forward. Thanks. Okay, before we answer, can we get one more question, just so we're teed up for the next one? Sure. My name is Dean Foreman. I'm the Chief Economist of the American Petroleum Institute. I have a question actually for each of you. So, Luis, if you could comment in the current political environment uh, with natural gas to Mexico being the most important or the largest gas export market for the U.S., about the prospects and some of the conflicts that have happened with gas pipelines recently. Um, to Jean Denis, they, having spent or lived four years in Calgary myself, you showed and you went through the price differential between WTI and Western Canadian Select. But could you talk about, um, you know, as we've seen now divestment by some uh, major companies of Canadian assets, in response largely to that cycle, and the fact that even though the differential's kind of gone back recently to kind of, uh, let's call it, bottom 25% levels, where it's a pretty large discount of heavy oil relative to WTI, it's gone through a cycle where over the last year, effectively, despite the drop off in heavy oil from Venezuela coming into the US Gulf Coast, the inability to get more of it into the US effectively cost Canada through that low price cycle, the ability to incentivize the producers to invest more in rail or trucking or other ways of getting into market. So Alberta specifically, their market intervention has changed that nexus. And my question to you is whether there's one Canada or whether there's really a fractured Canada from a federal view as you see it, and okay. how that could play out in the future. Just, and I know you can't overly predict it in my commenter, but just your insight on that. 
Okay. Okay. Tish, I really enjoyed your comments. I mean, Colorado is a really contentious place for a lot of this. Is API, if we embrace as an industry that the risks of climate change are real, and we are through the environmental partnership and other efforts trying to move the ball forward with it. But when we survey consumers about what they're actually willing to pay to address this, the most frequent answer is like 50 cents or a dollar per month. And it's pretty rare to have a household or an individual step up and say they pay more than about $10 a month. Yet, some of the elements of whether it's the Green New Deal, addressing infrastructure challenges, you're spot on in terms of classifying exactly the way the debate is cast and some of the challenges to it. But when there's transparency around what it costs and who's willing to pay, how do you see that as an element in consumer preferences here? Thank you. Uh, Tisha, and then Luis, and then Jean-Denis, please. Okay, great. So uh, uh, just a quick remark. One could talk about legal challenges all day because they're one of the undiscussed areas of risk, particularly the new uh, climate, what did you know, when did you know it lawsuits, which are also going to inform what I consider a public check, check, check. tipping point of opposition. Um, but what, one thing I'll say be, from our experience here in Colorado is it's such a relief when you get legal clarity. When, when you finally have that final decision, it's legal. Um, we had that around bound fracking in Colorado. And we, we won and we celebrated and then we got a new legislature and they just changed the law. So the legal clarity I, I think is temp can be temporary if the public continues to generically oppose oil and gas as a fossil. Which will lead me into my second answer which is I completely agree that opposition to oil and gas is very often untethered to people's willingness to pay or willingness to be disrupted in any way. A community that bans fracking doesn't ban the use of oil and gas in their jurisdiction. So I'm just gonna say it's disconnected and it's still real. <laughs> the risk does not have to be tethered to reality. And I write a weekly um, blog, and this week, I think it's this week, or it might be next week, um, but it basically answers the question of will there be a reckoning? Will the public say we're not willing to have you um, continue to do things that will raise the price? I don't think there will be a reckoning. So spoiler alert if you're, if you're going to read that. Um, and, and so I think it's somewhat irrelevant that consumers are unwilling to pay because, but they're still willing to divest, ban, protest, um, and I, I, I don't see that those two disconnects are going to happen uh, are, are going to reconcile soon. Um, and I'll just note, um, in economists speak, that means that it turns out that human beings behave irrationally. Right? And so that, that, that inconvenient truth of the matter we're all dealing with. And I think it's a really good point, regardless of what the economics are. If you can't build a pipeline, you can't build a pipeline. And we got to step back and say, how can we change that? How can we, how can we change the conversation in a way that we can move things forward? Um, but it won't, it won't likely be based on all the economic models that we love so dearly and we need. Right? Okay. Next question, sir. Hi, um, Omar Cabrales. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I have, yeah, we didn't do we didn't do everybody. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we, sorry. False, no. false start. Don't worry. Don't worry. Now it was about this uh, natural gas pipelines conflicts that happened in Mexico recently. Well, first of all, obviously the natural gas system and the and, and infrastructure of the system and gas, which is the name of the of the system, is very vulnerable. I mean, it, it very it's very limited. That's why we have a five year plan which actually is, is the way to expand strategically our network. And in that respect, I have to say that, well, the, actual, the, the current government actually knows the relevance of this, uh, of this uh, energy source. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the electricity generation matrix, we, we, we depend above 50 percent on, on natural gas. And particularly the uh, peninsula in Yucatan, it's, it's a very vulnerable place. Actually, we have had problems this year so far in terms of, 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 of shortages of, 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 the, of the source and, of course, of electric generation. We obviously uh, kind of like uh, interconnectedly uh, worsen the problem because there were some uh, infrastructure projects going on with the interconnection of our grid that this government actually again impeded. So having said that, this government knows that there are very good opportunities in terms of exploiting that interconnection of the natural gas systems mainly to 
manufacturing and also to uh, petrochemical. There is this uh, strong commitment apparently of this government towards starting to produce uh, locally or domestically more fertilizer. So we need and we haven't had that production because we haven't had natural gas, we haven't had the precursors, not ammonia, not uh, urea. So, uh, so we need to start working on that. Problem that I see is that these conflicts actually were apparently like a, a very good experiment. It actually, probably it was an, an experimental economist that actually told the, uh, the government, well, let's see how the, the IP is going to react with this new type of uh, negotiation process where something that was placed already, now you're going to bring them to the table, renegotiate the terms of the contracts, and we'll see how this goes. And let's see if the rest of the participants in the markets follow that. And apparently, they, it, it worked for them, that's what they say, but every every participant in the energy sector from the academic standpoint, from the uh, government standpoint, from the consultant everywhere, they, they claim that, well, we don't know if that deal actually was in benefit of the government because we don't know the numbers. It was not transparent. No one knows really the numbers behind those contracts. Apparently what they did was that the, um, the prize that was contracting the, in, 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 with all the four pipelines, one of them was very important in the Texas to Tuxpan zone. Well, one of the, the prices were going to start to escalate over time for 20 years. But they say, well, like, well, you know what? I don't want those prices. I just prefer a flat. Uh, tariff for the next 30 and 35 years. And actually what they did probably was that they increased present, uh, net present value of the project. And actually that's what the minister, former minister of, of, of Hacienda, which is actually my neighbor at office, Carlos Urso is my, is my neighbor at the, at the office, basically he claims that, that, what's hap that what, what really happened, that they, they, they didn't even understand what net present value is. So. In those terms, what I'm most concerned about, rather than that, is that the new function of the independent system operator of the natural gas network, which is Senegas, is going to be totally captured by the government. The current uh, general director is uh, very close to the CEO of Pemex. Actually, they are a couple. And, um, they have been operating under very dark circumstances, giving contracts to their uh, relatives, daughters, sons, cousins, aunts, uncles, whatever you name it. And what we are very concerned about is that it's not going to operate as an independent system operator. So that certainly is going to prevent the access to the grid to private parties other than Pemex. So that's, that's the true concern there. And the opportunity would be to actually start working together in terms as block from the IP standpoint and not in particular uh, little groups. For example, if you take, let's say, the example of the renewable energy groups, they are fighting independently. So the wind producers are going to lobby. The solar don't like the wind producers, so they say, well, we go on our own. And what we need to do is to, we are a whole sector, we are uh, in terms of, in economic terms, we are the ones that are carrying the burden of the dead weight loss that is happening because of this government intervention. So we need to, to work as a group there in the country to start turning things back on track. Thank you. So that was quite of an interesting question. Thank you from a Kenyan perspective. I mean, touching on uh, Alberta market intervention, Venezuela, and concluding on <laughs> is, is Canada fragmented? And you know, from a Franco, Canadian working in Alberta on pipelines, I can tell you that I, I get those questions when I go back to Montreal. So let me kind of just tie a couple of things together here. Uh, so the, the production curtailment in Alberta, in my view, uh, were put in place to address the acute situation that was unfolding in the fall of 2018. And then as pipeline events went on, i.e. the delay of line three, then curtailment is being maintained to bridge between fall 2018 and uh, line three coming in online 2020, 2021. Uh, and I mean, regardless of curtailment, the fact that the five major pipelines were not actually built, as I spoke in my remarks, really left the industry with no other choice than to use rail as a relief valve for the incremental capacity, but rail is not a 
pipeline size solution. It's only to, to, to kind of bridge the gap between kind of the lumpiness of pipeline capacity addition. Um, so whether, I mean, the fact that Venezuela's production has been declining, from Alberta's perspective, I think is a missed opportunity in the sense of the lack of pipeline capacity, lack of access. I remember answering questions about, well, couldn't Canada make a difference here? I, I guess Canada would like to, but Canada cannot because pipelines are fully utilized to the level of 99% utilization throughout. So, so realistically speaking, if production, let's if we assume a world where uh, there is no curtailment of production. The fact that there is no more pipeline being built uh, implicitly puts a cap on production until TMX gets online, line three, and potentially, eventually, uh, Keystone XL. But those things now work hand in hand. And then, in terms of uh, like what's like what's going on with Canada at the, at the most macro level. Uh, there was a federal election just earlier in October, uh, giving so it's a minority government government from the Liberal Party. Um, but my kind of back of the envelope interpretation of the results is that the majority of Canadians actually are okay with pipelines, because if you look at the position of each party and their position regarding Trans Mountain, the majority of Canadians want pipeline. And the way I interpret that is that the majority of Canadians actually support economic growth and they recognize the importance of energy in Canada. And then at, at the same time, the majority of Canadians voted for the carbon tax. So the environment is also a, a very important consideration, probably just as much as economic growth. So then the, the challenge for the country going forward, and I think it can be replicated to many other countries around the world, is that how can we continue to prosper economically while reducing our JG emissions? And that's really kind of the, the, the holy grail of, of any politician in my mind. Thanks, Jean Denis. Okay, uh, if you could introduce yourself and make sure there's a question. <laughs> Omar Cabrales with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, do you see a risk that public activism and uh, nationalist policies would uh, affect uh, the North American energy integration over the long term? Good question. Yeah. For anyone? I think, yeah, that's for anyone. Do you want me to give mine to? So I'm Peter Hartley from Rice University. I guess the question I was going to ask is, um, you know, a, a possible alternative pushback that none of you discussed, and I, I, maybe it's not very big, but uh, is that um, the energy industry is a source of high-paying blue-collar jobs um, and uh, also uh, has regional political implications. You think of uh, the Western states in Canada, you think of people talking about banning fracking in the United States, that's going to go over not very well in a state like Texas. Uh, Democrats think they're going to win Texas, not with a policy that's banning fracking, I don't think. So, um, uh, you know, what's, where do we see any pushback from, from uh, employees in the energy industry as being another vested interest uh, with high wages, high blue-collar wages? Uh, is that going to go anywhere? Okay. okay, I think the first question is open to the whole panel. Luis, you want to start? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, in terms of the integration, I would certainly say that it would probably not uh, eliminate the possibility of integration, but certainly make it harder. I mean, if you look into the uh, platform of the Mexico's president, is uh, you remember we joined through the process of energy reform to the International Energy Agency, and actually that was to accommodate certain standards that you already have in the U.S. and Canada in terms, of, let's say, fuel storage or, or natural gas storage and, and like. And the idea of this platform is that we have to evaluate if it's convenient for Mexico to belong to the IEA because in the view of this administration, we are, close, we are more close to the OPEC countries. So uh, if you look at that, then, then you'll see that uh, basically this administration goes in a completely different direction from what it understands as an integrated region. But I would say that at the local level, those are the great opportunities that the country have. We certainly have uh, firms going back and forth from uh, San Diego to Tijuana, from Reynosa to uh, Brownsville to, to Juarez, El Paso, that are certainly integrated not just in energy terms, but rather in, in all resources. and. Uh, 
in, in labor mobility. So certainly uh, we would hope that, and that's what we as a school of government at Tech de Monterrey are trying to work on, trying to work with state and local governments so that they actually can become the champions. And they might raise their hand and say, well, you know what, at the federal level, you might have this idea, but that certainly is not what's going on in my on, a, on my daily basis here. So that's what we're trying to, to construct with the local and state uh, governments that might actually, together with uh, firms, actually start to, to, to create other opportunities for integration. Yeah, I'll just speak to, to one thing about the, the, the oil and gas worker and, and the, the threat to oil and gas workers of anti-oil and gas activism. So in Colorado, um, mobilization efforts for oil and gas workers have been very effective in defeating proposition. They take a ton of effort, a ton of money, and they're demoralizing and exhausting for employees. Um, so they can be extremely effective. I don't think they will continue to be as effective going forward for a few reasons. One, in a strong economy, um, it becomes less relevant. Colorado has 3.3% uh, unemployment. So now all the discussion is about this just transition. You will never find an oil and gas worker asking for a just transition. We know that. But that, that's where the narrative has moved. And if you have more voters interested in uh, decarbonization than you have oil and gas workers, the math just isn't going to work. At what point does that become relevant in Texas? We don't know. We certainly saw it was relevant in Alberta um, once the economy is threatened things shift. But what I will say is, is I, I've seen to be more important and more effective is the humanizing of the oil and gas industry. So the taking away, uh, so just arguing dollars puts you straight up against what's the life of my baby worth. So we bring this many economic do dollars and jobs and someone holding up their baby and saying, what's the life of my baby worth? You know, fracking will, will kill. So that's not effective except in very isolated incidents. But I'm your neighbor, I'm your teacher, I'm your, th th those kind of efforts which have to be really, I think, still um, grounded in a different kind of paradigm, one that's not war and one that's about shared ambitions for a shared future. And so I do, I believe, I, I love and, and um, feel a part of the oil and gas industry with a passion and I think our narrative of who we are and where we're going has to evolve. That may, may be a quick comment from me regarding energy inter integration. Um, I mean, fr from Canada's perspective, the energy sector in Canada actually has, has flourished on the basis of the integration with the U.S. Like this is based. This has been the main consumer of Canadian energy, and whether this is at risk due to populism or actually market forces, actually it has forced Canada to look globally for new customers because the the increased production of oil and gas in the US has really been a reckoning for the Canadian energy industry in that they needed to to find an, an alternative uh, yeah an alternative outlet for for their production so whether it's populism or simply market forces ultimately from a regulatory perspective uh, of course, environmental impacts, local communities will always be major factors as part of the assessment process. And also the, the, the counterbalancing aspect of this will be the economic need of the project and whether the facilities will be used at a reasonable level, level over its economic life. And understanding the factors that might influence that, whether it's populism, economics, climate policies, is, is something that uh, the CER will continue to focus on for sure. Thanks, Jean-Denis. Daniel? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Ramey from Resources for the Future. I have a question that uh, maybe multiple people on the panel can, can address. Uh, Tisha, you mentioned earlier communities that want to restrict production but don't want to restrict their consumption. I'm kind of interested in the flip side of that. So we have jurisdictions out there like California. Um, if we look to Europe, we have Norway and examples of uh, jurisdictions that are really trying to reduce their domestic emissions, but it seems like a harder lift for them, at least in some ways, politically perhaps, to restrict their exports and production of fossil fuels, uh, particularly oil. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone can speak to uh, 
sort of early discussions that might be underway at the federal policy level, probably in Canada, uh, or maybe in some state governments here in the US, or maybe in some other examples that you might know about, where um, policymakers are starting to think about not just restricting uh, domestic emissions, but also restricting the emissions that might get exported from the fuels that are produced locally. Thanks, Daniel. Um, next question. Uh, Will Frazier, uh, National, <coughs> National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, Tisha, your point about the um, these pledges for 100% clean energy that don't have a clear pathway and the idea that this is creating something of a vacuum that oil and gas companies could step into. Uh, the obvious thing to point out there is carbon capture and sequestration. Um, you hear something, you hear about it time and time again, but I, I'm not aware of a whole lot of actual interest in development. And my question is, do you guys think that these 100% pledges are enough to incentivize development in that, or is that only something that's going to happen in response to a carbon tax or some other sort of um, something that happens in the, in the sector? Wants to go. Yeah. So uh, I, I think a lot of the attempts to cut emissions suffer from the same problems of the the ban development in that a lot of very well intentioned um, policymakers have oversimplified solutions and the easiest example of that is is the electrify everything. The, you know, we will ban gas stoves and gas heaters in all new, new development. That's becoming a trend. And it, it, it's nonsense if you care about life cycle emissions. But it sounds good, and people think um, that it makes sense. So I'm not exactly answering your question, except to say that the, the transformation I made in my own mind and heart in the last year is to stop trying to make this make sense, and to start trying to address what's happening on the ground, which is policymakers, citizens, shareholders, um, and pretty much everyone you need to get your project approved uh, is looking at the world through a very, a very oversimplified lens. And as an industry, we've been focused on educating, 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 but there's a lot of biases, which the behavioral econom economists in here know uh, f a, a, a lot about, which I now have an honorary PhD in because of working at the interface of this space. So um, I think that both sides of the equation suffer. And, and what my uh, desire in speaking with both sides about this and, and in a room like this is that the, the middle space is actually a very dangerous space, the, the place of pragmatic path forward. No one wants their city council to say, I propose 8% less emissions because we can actually do it and it will help. No, you know, no, one, no one wants to see that. So I think it becomes our job to create, to create um, that space. Um, and then with the question about uh, the do, do I think the 100% pledges will work? So again, in the last year, I've changed my mind on a lot of things that's perhaps become, that should be my business card. It's just, ch I changed my mind. Um, but, but the aspirational is working in a really cool way. And an example would be um, Exxon's $100 million 10-year commitment to partnership with NREL. There's uh, the investments in carbon engineering. One can argue that they're not a relevant dollar amount from oil and gas companies and international majors, but I think they're very important steps in the right direction. And what is even more interesting is that that as soon as we can produce net negative oil and gas, think about how that conversation is going to go. Because as you probably know, people who are really hawks on zero carbon don't like the idea of carbon capture sequestration because it empowers the use of fossils. So, uh, so I think where I hope we are in a couple years is we're having a debate about how to talk about net carbon negative oil and gas production. And then, we, then we're in a fruitful, interesting territory and not just banning and making nonsensical regulation. Uh, and then bridging to uh, federal policy in Canada. Uh, I mean, I've been talking uh, quite a bit about the regulation of pipeline, which is the core mandate of the CER. And another part of our mandate includes providing energy information. And we, we run uh, an annual analysis of Canada's energy futures. And the way we go about it is that we model current policies that have sufficient details for us to basically to, to, to codify it and to model. And our analysis shows that there is still potential for Canada to increase its oil and gas production uh, quite, market, quite remarkably uh, in, in the world where 
uh, there is a price on carbon, at least in Canada, and assuming that Canadian producers can compete on a global basis. So from a policy perspective, um, we need to look at what is written, because there has been a lot of talk, lots of rhetoric. But when we go back to the office and we start to model Canada's energy futures, we look at what is written, and based on that, we see uh, potential growth for both oil and gas, provided that there is uh, adequate, actually, infrastructure to reach those markets. So, and I think when I, I pointed out the, um, the preamble of the CR Act, specifically mentioning global competitiveness, to me that is a signal that from a, a policy perspective there is this desire to, to, to continue to supply energy, uh, whether it's hydrocarbons or renewables, uh, as long as it is done in a manner that respects the environment. Uh, just very brief, uh, and just because a, a thought that was given at the uh, geopolitics table, uh, no, no, at the keynote, at the keynote presentation of the uh, governor, because the, the question was, is policy necessary, or is it sufficient, or is it both? And I would say that for this particular type of thing, I would say it's 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 not enough because uh, if you look into if you take into account that uh, roughly half half of the demand for for oil and in the next 20 years is going to be coming from non combusted use of, of fuels, uh, then you have to realize that whatever we do at the policy level and the market forces is not going to change that matter. And the driver of that is petrochemicals now, whereas 50, uh, petrochemicals only accounts for 5% of global emissions by 2050 still makes a difference in terms of what we are doing to address that problem that we have there. That, that would be the, the white elephant for me in the, in the room. And in that regard, I would say that uh, we need to use policy as a driver for the necessity, and the necessity is uh, the acceleration of material design, it means quantum chemistry, uh, to start actually arriving to that point where we can actually make a difference in that regard and not just uh, wait for the right policy or the right in market mechanisms to arrive. Great. Any other questions from the floor? Okay. Well, um, I I'm, am struck by uh, this, this question about populism and nationalism and what is that going to mean for integration of our markets and how that really was an interesting prompt for me to think about something that has sort of actually, whether by name or not, been reflected in each of our panelists' remarks, is that it, it turns out, darn it, that politics is local. And it's becoming, uh, as relates to energy, hyper-local, hyper I like that term, like reminding us it goes back to, to, where, you, to where you live. And, um, and from the North American perspect uh, perspectives represented here, I'll just note that I, I take away from this Luis's comments that in order to, to address this hyperlocalism, it's not about countering it, I, I, I've taken away. It's, it is. We have to engage it. Right? That's where the decisions are going to be made in this transition. Particularly, as Louise notes, we move into the focus on petrochemicals, chemical, you know, how we turn hydrocarbons into chemicals and materials. That's super distributed decision making. We don't have regulated utilities in that space, for example. right? And Louise's comment that it's really important that we educate and engage our local and state government leaders. And, and that, um, I think, was reflected in some comments uh, from the floor about the importance of jobs in this, that we need to bring people through this transition uh, in a way that has well-paying jobs. And that is going to be the primary concern of local and state leaders, so making sure we're engaging them to, um, as we we're educating them to engage in this hyper-local hyper conversation. Um, Tisha, you really sh your comment really sh struck me that um, we, we have to begin these conversations from a place of shared ambitions around a future that we want to inhabit together. And um, that's, that's not incremental thinking, right? That's not about solving today's problem. It's about reminding us that there's a long term, that we're all in it together, and communicating that to other people. Uh, because when make people, I find that when, when people are drawn into those conversations, they find ways to work together, right? That are that are not about the current entrenched interest. Like nobody wants to run out into the village square by themselves to you know solve the problem tomorrow. But if we can be in a conversation where we're thinking about being useful long term around shared values, I think that's really powerful and really well said. 
And then finally, Jean Denis, this um, again on this point of hyperlocalism, I was thinking about your comments about how the regulatory framework has been adapted to uh, focus more on the economic needs for projects, but, but framing economics rather broadly in the, is in the social context and what's on people's minds and are they concerned about reconciliation, are they concerned about greenhouse gas emissions, in that um, taking all of that into consideration as we think about projects, which I think it taps into uh, a way to begin to, from a regulatory perspective, engage in this hyper-local activism ourselves. So thank you all for your remarks and your insights that you shared with, here with us today. Thanks for the questions from the floor. And uh, may we all prosper in engaging hyper-locally. <laughs>
the survey is sort of Hi there. It's nice to see you there in the back of the room. Smiling face. Just 